Feedback. We're professionals here. Um, cool. All right. So uh, thanks everybody for coming. Um, like I said, this is my slide deck here is pretty short and sweet. Um, uh, also, since I was at Disney last week, my back and legs hurt, so I'm gonna we're gonna do a casual sit down uh, situation here. Uh, I want to be like super conversational, like I, you know, you can talk from the title of the talk. We're gonna talk about kind of the ops side of DevOps a little bit. So like, I don't want to just uh, read off slides for 45 minutes or however long this takes. So um, for sure, anybody has thoughts, comments, questions, things I've missed, feel free to jump in. Um, about me, for those who don't know me, um, this is me last week at Disney World. Uh, Chewbacca does not care for my uh, first order T-shirt. Uh, fun store actually got this t-shirt for free uh, because I mispacked. I grabbed what I thought was my Star Wars shirt and it was actually had, like 10 navy blue shirts and I didn't look at and look at like turn it right side out. And so the manager at outside Star Tours at Hollywood Studios was like, why don't you have a shirt to match your family? And it's like, I grabbed the wrong shirt. Mm -hmm. So we ride Star Tours, walk back out and the guy's like, uh, come with me, I'm gonna give you a shirt. <laughs> um, coming up on 20 years uh, in various tech roles, tech support up through systems, software network engineering. Um, I'm currently at petfinder.com. I work with Mr. Johnson here in the red shirt, uh, supporting petfinder.com from uh, doing system engineering. Before that, I spent two and a half years at Chef. Um, a couple jobs before that, I was at Scripps for a couple of years uh, before the discovery swoop in. Uh, Fish Me is a security oriented SaaS company and a bunch of other places if we went far enough back in the way back machine. Uh, all right, so let's start with like, what is a DevOps? What, what do we mean when we say DevOps? Which at this point, like that word has like a hundred definitions, right? Like if you ask 10 people what DevOps is, you'd get probably 12 answers. Um, so it's got a couple of different levels. Like what's, you know, where does the word come from? Like here are so many definitions of DevOps and I just like jump straight into like, oh, it's a culture and it's a tool set and you gotta have Jenkins, and you gotta have Chef or Terraform. Or, like if you boil it down to its basic thing, like you take the word development, the word operations and jam them together, right? It's, that's kind of the, sometimes the easiest way to start thinking about a concept is to like look at the word. Um, also, it also does mean a culture. I mean, we could go, this would be another like two hour mm -hmm. talk if we got into all the things that DevOps. So two things jump out to me are collaborative and cross-functional collaboration between those two groups that make up the word. And then it's also a skill set. So you, you know, it, when I was at Chef, we were famous for saying like, you can't buy DevOps, but it is a you know, skill set. You'll frequently see DevOps engineer titles. And these are just, you know, some of the skills that you'll frequently see associated with those. It's like, now that we've kind of talked a little bit like what it is, like, why do we do it? Why do we care? Why does it matter? Uh, the biggest thing to me is like in 2019, nobody really delivers software anymore. Like, does anybody else remember going to, micro, or going to Walmart and buying Microsoft Encarta on a disc, <laughs> right? Like that was shipping software, like downloading software off an FTP server to install on your, on your computer. Like then you didn't have to worry about this, this development ops collaboration, like collaboration, like development wrote some software. All ops had to do is like put it on a server to be downloaded or help get the CDs printed or whatever. And you know, that was how you, you ship software. But now in 2019, everything's a, a service. Like I remember when Netflix's product was, they sent you a DVD in the mail, right? I'm old enough to remember when Amazon was a bookstore. Like now all these companies, like, you know, when I was at Chef, our CEO, Barry Chris was famous for saying like every, every company is a software company now. It's like, it's more accurate to me to say every company, not every is, is an overstatement, an intentional overstatement, but your, your services companies. Like petfinder.com is a service. Like if petfinder goes down, the people who want to get their pets adopted don't care if it's an infrastructure problem or application problem. So the whole, this is normally where I'd have my the little girl with the flaming house, you know, worked in dev and ops problem now. Uh, meme, like nobody cares. Like if you go to Amazon and you're desperate to buy something, you need it like prime next day shipping and you click add to cart and you get like 500 error. You're not calling Amazon and being like, I need to know if this is an application problem or an infrastructure problem. You're like, I need my shit. Like, why is this not working? Um, again, I just referenced this and everybody's a software company now. So we're all in, com in competitive markets. Like, you know, you, if you can't get your software, your service out at a high rate of speed and in a reliable fashion, like your competitors in whatever market you're in are gonna eat your lunch, right? While you're struggling to figure out how to deliver and operate your software, your, your competitors are, are lapping you in features. And uh, kind of the last thing I had here was efficient use of resources. So like a lot of the stuff that goes into, into DevOps is around automation, right? Like get rid of all the manual tasks, the things that take humans time, human beings time when it shouldn't. Um, so like the less time you're working on like bringing the site back online because of a deployment problem or an application bug or an infrastructure problem, the, 
the more time you're building those features that you know beating your competitors. It's like I've heard a lot of DevOps talks that go really heavily into like putting a development mindset into operations. So you talk about things like infrastructure as code, you know, introducing things like version control and testing and uh, and releasing artifacts, bringing that mindset into from from developers into into the infrastructure. Uh, kind of what I want to talk about tonight is kind of the other side of the coin, like. A lot of places treat ops as kind of like an, an after the fact thing, like especially in the, in the old style, like we just throw an artifact over the wall and then you guys, here's a wiki page and an artifact, like best of luck to you. Um, it's a cost. Yeah, exactly. And uh, and yeah, and it's just like, you know, I've, I've been in situations where that, that the dev to ops handoff for a production service was a wiki page and like a 30 minute meeting where we could ask questions as ops about the wiki page and like, all right, sweet, good luck. You know, if it breaks too bad, you can call us, but otherwise, otherwise you're on your own. It's like, it's very, it was just very much a, we've gone off in a hole and built the application and now we're handing it to you. Like we didn't ask you, ask you your opinion along the way at any point. We built it and now we're, we're just tossing it over the wall to you. So uh, it's like all the stuff I'm going to talk about here is like not that stuff. Like there's always the after deployment running in production stuff that, that comes along with operations. So what I'm talking, what I'm going to be talking about is the things that operations can provide if they're involved from a software project early in the process. Yes. New guy in the back. Yeah. Um, I'm a systems administrator in Loud, yeah. and my career is just who I am. Uh, is is really hit a wall and really feel like I'm losing. You know, I'm not going anywhere, so this is why I'm here. Um, awesome. We're looking at being a scrum master, looking at, at at that. You know, turning my career this way. Where, where does Scrum fit into this? I'm, I'm a man. I joined the Agile Knoxville Club as well. But where did I, I hear you talking something like that, or am I missing that? Is that is a Scrum kind of one of the people that, that talks about early stage software and a project and all of that? I mean, if you're at a if you're at a place that's using Agile and doing Scrum, I mean that's that's a good place for an, an ops person, an administrator background to get plugged in during the development process. You're gonna have a scrum master who's running the agile project where the agile project is building whatever the service or the software is. I, I, I'm so, I'm removed from any development, any operations, anything. I, I'm, right. I, I, I'm, I'm imaging computers and, and doing desk site support and troubleshooting and that kind of thing, which I right. really don't want to do. I'd rather do something else. So I, I'm investigating different avenues in, in, in the career that seems to be going places. Yeah. And so I, I'm just kind of wondering where DevOps is in relationship to Scrum. I have project management experience, but I'm trying to see are they parallel? Are they, you know, are they, you know, is it, you know, I'm just trying to yeah. identify it. Yeah, I mean, Agile, Scrum, like those are project management techniques and, and styles that are very common in today's software development world. Right. Um, so the place that those would kind of intersect with what we're talking about here is just like, like I was saying, historically, a lot of times the that Scrum process has been a Scrum master and maybe a project manager or a product owner, and then the developers, and then they'll build something and then be like, come back to the system administrators and be like, here's your jar file or your MSI installer or whatever. Best of luck. So is this a component of Scrum, or would you consider Scrum and a component of this? Or is that I don't think they're tightly coupled. Like, I mean, you can certainly do, you can implement a DevOps culture without doing Scrum and you can do Scrum without doing this. You can do Scrum in the old style of developers build a thing and toss it over the fence at, at ops. And so they're, uh, you find them in a lot of the same place. Like a lot of people who have adopted Agile and Scrum are the same types of places that have adopted DevOps approaches, but they're not necessarily, you can do one without the other. Okay, okay. thank you. Yeah, for sure. Good explanation. Uh, yeah, it's like I'm gonna, and you know, that's my next point here. Like, yeah, the, the things I'm gonna kind of hit on tonight are things that that an operational person, person with an operational background, can provide if they are involved from the get go. Not, I'm not gonna dive as much into the like stuff that we, you know, everybody here that has a systems infrastructure background knows happens with the production services. Um, so yeah, so the first point is like, yeah, just providing that operational mindset, like to get away from that. I, it works on my laptop, so it must be fine mindset that can happen, right? Never. Never, never <laughs> right. So like, I mean, you know, I won't name any, any company names, uh, but yeah, I worked at a place once where our main product was a rails app that had been built as a proof of concept on somebody's laptop. And the thing that ran in production seven years later was a very lightly modified version of that proof of concept.
concept. <laughs> like it was, it had no no operational thought built into it. It was like, oh, this, that's a great idea. That's a cool thing you built. Let's put that in production and start charging for it. It'll be fantastic. Wow. Good. Hey, it's not sure. <laughs> we got a few. Yeah. Pause for minutes. Yeah, I think I can uh, pause the recording here while we grab pizza. <laughs> All right, now that we have uh, turned for pizza break. Uh, all right, so we're in the midst of talking about what, what uh, your operational folks can provide if we uh, kind of bring them in from the beginning. So uh, talk a little about the operational mindset, uh, kind of getting those operational concerns addressed in the application from the beginning. Um, also just like being there as a person to represent the, the operational interest, like, Hey, you're talking about a lot of like clustering and network stuff. Like you're going to need like you know, firewall rules or security groups if you're on Amazon or, or whatever. Or, hey, it sounds like you're going to need uh, RabbitMQ or Redis or some supporting service. Like we should, we should go ahead and start planning for that. You still, you find shops <clears throat> are developed. I mean, the way you describe the world is people are writing software and then they're putting it into operation. I haven't seen that for 10 years. Where we fire up a virtual machine or a service and we start coding on it. Um, the only thing we do when we go to, to the outside world is uh, scale. Right. But you find people are still writing software and then, oh, yeah, and then for sure. saying, what are, how are we going to put this in the world? Oh, for sure. Yeah, that's absolutely. Yes. <laughs> yeah, especially I see it most. I, I, I like to think it's happening less, but it's for sure, for sure still happening. In the cases where I've seen it, I've seen it most where you're integrating with other systems, or you're you've created something that is not something you can run on a laptop. There might be a test environment that is managed by developing staff, or that is just used as a sandbox. But from the operations perspective, that doesn't exist. That's not part of the level. Yeah, most larger shops, you know, the, the developers don't deploy the code that runs in production, I would say. That's, and this is, this is sort of a transitional change of that. But, you know, I was talking to a major employer, you know, recently, and, you know, their, their deployment system was still you know, an operations guy dragging the, mm -hmm. dragging the binary from one machine to another. At a previous employer, uh, one of our SOX auditors' requirements were that the developers could not be the initiator of any deployment to production systems, or the sole initiator. There had to be at least some other manual approver, even if this process started automatically. The development group as a whole could not deploy software to production. So our, our ad sales system is the same way, right? So it was a multi-billion dollar system. And after Sarbanes-Oxley came in, our CEO was you know, facing jail time if he couldn't certify that you know, this was correct, right? That it matched the financials that were published in a 10Q or whatever. 10K. 10K, thank you. And we had to have you know, a dev system that we certified match the prod system. And we had to have one group of engineers develop the install of the dev system and another group of engineers install it on the dev system. And then a wholly separate engineers in prod would use those instructions, you know, to install it there. So to get politicians ready to play that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but here's the thing, right? None of that was dictated by Sarban's office, right? The interpretation. Yes, yeah. it, was, it was up to the interpretation. <clears throat> My comment was like, you know, I can write a policy to enforce all this and guarantee everything. We can deploy, you know, a thousand times a day. Be confident that everything is still compliant, but it's a tough sell. Sometimes, <clears throat> my company developed we developed MedFlash 11 years ago, and, and there was no Azure, there was no AWS, and we we put four racks in a data center in Tampa, Florida. 17 floors off the ground, and we 
got an IP address, and we wrote software into that, into those machines, and it ran there. I mean, it never occurred to us to run the software on our laptop. I mean, everybody was running it on their laptop, but but they every day they had to move their code into the data center, not because we had some high pollutant discipline, but it never occurred to us that our software would run in the world at large at scale. It's got to be much we easier. Wrote it on our, you know what I mean? If we didn't yeah. write it. Well, your average laptop in, in now, world. your average laptop now supports virtualization and has 16 gigs right. of RAM. And I'm not going there's no way that I would be able to deploy, you know, even a database and app, a proper web server and, app, and an application server have any reasonable performance on a laptop of 15 years ago. Especially if I start getting close to the world of load testing or anything mo even moderately complicated, it's going to melt the machine. Right. <clears throat> but, so, so you're saying that as the machines have gotten bigger and the virtualization has become common, uh, people have stopped they have deploying their software until after it's written and tested. I mean, they haven't made no stop at all. When somebody can perform a test run on their on their workstation, they don't have a need to build an operationalized system. When I have, they do. They work for me. I mean, <laughs> if, well, if I'm writing them a check or if you're writing, company policy notwithstanding, the the end developer doesn't doesn't need to do that to be able to perform the basic functions of their job. Yeah. So I would but say this. You know, it, it sounds almost like you're saying there was no official test. No. versus official testing. Yeah. I would say DevOps, for the most case, includes like pretty rigorous testing as part of that deployment. It's just all automated. Yeah, there's a, something called an extreme yeah, programming. Yeah. DevOps yeah, it is things. today, but I mean, it wasn't then. Nothing was automated even four or five years ago, right? I mean, there was very it, little Yeah, automation. more and more. Yeah, it, it's, it's easier now, with, especially with the advent. I mean, I would argue with we're kind of going off the rails here, but I would argue that you know, the API access into the infrastructure enabled a, a, a tremendous explosion in automation. I'm able to automate my data center, which right. no nobody was doing that you know, right. 10 years ago. Right. Anyway, let's, let's yeah, we're, we're really still in time. This right, is cool. a far conversation. Um, <laughs> okay, so like I've kind of hand waved around like you know, we can do operational mm -hmm. things in software. So I'm uh, just going to quote a quick bullet list to kind of like, you know, these are the things that came to mind when I made this list of. Operational concerns where operational folks can have can have some good input. Um, I'm sure it's incomplete. Um, so we care about deploying, right? Like we want to make sure that deployment process is repeatable and reliable to get it from from environment to environment. Um, like you're just talking about scaling, so like making sure that it can scale off that one developer's laptop if it needs to be. Um, we need to know how we can get insights and know when there are issues, when those scaling or performance problems do happen, right? Like Oh, it's slow. The application, we put it in production through a load test data and it's slow. Fantastic. Let's go dig through a million lines of code to figure out why it's slow. You know, like we need to figure out how we can instrument the applications, to figure out no, it's this, it's this SQL query or it's this function has a somebody put a you know ten thousand loop in it to <clears throat> so I can take a zero off later and make it seem like they've made it faster. <laughs> um, you know. Applications rarely exist in a vacuum. They need databases, they need web services, they need caches, they need queuing systems. Like these are all typically services that uh, you know, operations is relied upon to provide um, security, right? Like the security requirements when somebody's working on a, on a project locally or not, what we have for security, especially when we have things like SOX and HIPAA and, and all their, all their, oops, and then uh, ad hoc and scheduled tasks, so like things that, you know, uh, and a lot of systems that happen on like a cron job or something you log onto your application server and run a command to do some administrative. Oh good, new version of programming Phoenix is up. Um, yes, yeah, so like you know, making sure we have a way to do ad hoc and schedule tasks and the application needs. Um, so, so just kind of go through these bullet points in a little more detail. So uh, deploying, so like we wanna make sure the deployments A are as similar as possible between environments. So like if your, your laptop to dev deployment or your dev QA employment is a totally different process than when you go from QA or staging to production, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, problems, right? So we want to make those repeatable and we want to make them as similar as possible. So that's, we're not only testing the software in dev and QA, we're testing our deployment process. 
so when you're ready to go to production, that process has been tested and, and validated. Um, if I can give like a, a quick example, like at the Pathfinder <laughs> group, um, we got caught between our our staging environment and our production environment, where we like, oh, we got everything the same. You know, it, it's the same, same operating system, same database, same versions, and yet in production, I don't know if no one was there yet, but in production. They were getting some errors on some batch jobs, like out of like out of the queue in our, in our worker layer. And what we found it to be the difference, why we never saw it in the staging environment, is in production we've got database replicas, and the replication lag, like, even though it was like ten milliseconds, was every now and then just enough <coughs> to, to you know this record isn't there yet. And we never saw it in the staging environment. And we thought, no, we got everything. It's like, no, we, we didn't have everything. We didn't replicate our data to a second server, which we may have. You know, we need. We might have not even had the volume to trip over it, but it was just a lesson to be like, ooh, there still was that little shred of difference that that caught us. Oh, okay, another. Wait, another issue later uh, after I started, where um, they changed <coughs> the developers changed the um the format of the RabbitMQ messages. Oh, yeah. We went through dev and QA fine because there were no existing queue messages because they were empty because those environments aren't hit. We deploy it to production and there's existing queue messages with the old format and all of a sudden our worker jobs that work the queues are like, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I can't read this. Right. They also didn't have a dead letter queue, so it just kept oh, trying no. the same thing. It's yeah, okay. it, it did this a whole bunch over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this, 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 this stuff happens. The, the database queue. migration bands. Um, yes, the database migration takes us to the next point. So, like, you know, deploying software is never just dropping an artifact on a system. Like, you need uh, database migration. So, a lot of times, the service needs to be to be bounced to pick up the new binary you just dropped in place. You have an application I won't name that Tim and I may work on has like 14 different levels of cache <laughs> that need to be cleared. Some some need to be cleared on the place. So, you need to have some. We want to, as we're working with our developers, like make sure we have a way that we can automate those tests. So it's not like, oh, well, every time you deploy, you have to log into Redis and clear these cache keys out. I already talked about making them identical between environments. Uh, make sure you know how to roll back. Not that deployments ever go bad, but in the off chance that ever happens one day, um, especially you know, if you're running any sort of like fairly mission critical service, like having a, a quick and well understood rollback that you do not want to be sitting there with production down and being like, how do we get back from here? <laughs> Not that I've ever been sitting in that seat. I say your database layer there is probably your most critical. Yeah, I mean, yeah, knowing, sure knowing how to, right having there. undoes um, for your database yeah, migration is probably database. the biggest. Now you're in the swamp. <laughs> is this even theoretically possible? <laughs> right. Uh, so, you know, take on scale a little bit earlier. So, like, understood, like, if you don't have an operational person involved with the application design from the get-go, like you don't know where all the bodies are buried when it comes to how do we scale this. Like I once worked on a another Rails app that had a lot of um, hard-coded and single-value IP addresses for talking to other parts of the system. So you know some of the people I worked with, oh, we just throw Amazon and now it's scalable and kind of auto-scaling group, and it'll just like shrink and grow and do all the magic. It's like no, this has got hard coded IP addresses and it can't even take a, an array. It's like a single string mm -hmm. string value. So like, you know, these are the kind of things like, yeah, if you have somebody who understands, you know, the, the operational side of it, that's kind of being involved in hearing the stand up tickets. And as soon as you hear somebody in your daily scrum be like, oh, today I'm putting in the place where we put the hard coded IP address, you'd be like, whoa, we need to, <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about that ticket offline a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, knowing the performance characteristics of the system again, this comes back to knowing how the application works, which you don't get if you don't get the application until it's done and all you have is a deployable artifact. Like, what's the first thing we're going to hit? Is this going to hit a memory barrier? Is this going to hit CPU? Are we going to peg network? Like, what's the what are the things we need to if we're going to do any sort of you know this is really this is really key to like you know, if you're doing a, a cloud auto scaling, but like what are the things I need to watch? Like, if you tell me to watch memory, but I'm going to hit I'm going to get CPU pegged before I ever get anywhere near memory, then my auto scale group's going to sit there at whatever size it starts at and I never know it needs to do anything. Um, you know, if you're going to do any sort of dynamic scaling, like if your spin up and configure provisioning of a new node takes 20 minutes, like don't bother. I mean, by the, by the time that load spike that you're trying to scale to meet, you know, you're, by the time your node comes up, like that's that load's probably gone, right? Um, so this is where you know in the cloud you get into like you know, 
running a configuration management like Chef or something that configures dynamically at runtime versus doing baking more stuff into the image so that it's already there and, and ready to go. Um, you know, if you're running a sort of distributed system, like understanding uh, the clustering requirements. So if you're running like a clustered like RabbitMQ or you're doing a clustered database server with replication, like if I do want to scale that, like what do I have to do? How do I have to let the other nodes know that the, these new nodes exist? Uh, which also ties into service discovery. So again, if you're running, you know, if you have different services or you have a clustered service and they need to find other nodes or other services, like how does how does that happen? Is it DNS? Is it something like console or etcd? Exactly, you got the hard coded IP address problem solved. I mean, um, we discover early in the process. <laughs> in the code commit, it just strings into graph on every release. Scaling below doesn't go down. <laughs> it keeps. I scaled up 10 new nodes, and the one node is still pegged. I don't know what's happening. Oh, I forgot we have to register the new nodes with the load balancer. Um, I, I kind of lump these together, even though uh, they're <coughs> not necessarily the same thing. But um, this basically just goes back to the like uh, the, the gathering performance. Well, it's kind of twofold. It's like there, there's you know, let's just start going back to two part of my bullet points. It's like there's just general status indicators for application. Like this is like your basic like up down. Like, do we need to sound the alarm? Is this thing totally, totally the, the more classic definition of monitoring? Um, but then like the more, like when you get into APM, or APM is uh, short for application performance monitoring and observability is kind of a new, new final term for similar metrics gathering. Um, yeah, like making sure that you have, you know, use something like uh, New Relic, I think Elasticsearch has an APM now and some other app dynamics. Some sort of tool where you can, you can work with your developers to go in the code as it's being written and be like, hey, this is, this database query could get gnarly, like let's put, let's put a wrap around that, like gather some data that lets us know if it's taken you know, a few milliseconds or a couple of seconds. So we can start, when we start getting those lags and our other monitoring starts letting us know that something's not responding as it should. We have, we don't have to go gathering that data on the fly with our pants on fire. We have somewhere that's already been, being grabbed and put. Uh, you want, you know, old school system resource monitoring, your, your Nagios or, or whatever, where you're gathering CPU systems, uh, <laughs> CPU memory, disk IO, network IO, um, because this is all related, right? This goes back to the whole idea of we're, we're delivering services, right? And the service is composed of software, it's composed of the network, it's composed of the systems, right? So we need data from all those things to be able to figure out what's going wrong. Like, I need to be able to see, at the same time I had a disk IO spike, I also, like, on the database server, like, this query went from a few milliseconds to two seconds. Like, maybe there's a, maybe there's a relation here. And this, I mean, this is the same thing. So, like, what we, we're getting all these data from these different sources, so now we need, like, a an elk stack or a Splunk or somewhere that we can put all this data and then like build some build some queries and indexing around that so that we can we can get alerted on that or if we need to find it on the fly we we have it all in a, a searchable format. Um, alerting, you know, obviously, if something's bad enough, we need to let people know. Um, security. So like this is another place that a lot of times when you're you're doing that local developer or dev environment, you don't you're not thinking as much about this. You're like, oh, we'll just pop open every port on every server just to make sure it all works and it'll be fine. And then you put it into a staging or production environment where you have network segregation between uh, between components or whatever. And it's like, oh, nobody can nobody can talk to anybody. So you know, there's a few different aspects here. You got network security, which obviously just hit on us. Secrets management. If anybody solves secrets, like I would love to talk to you over a whiskey later because uh, I, I've, 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 I've yet to meet anybody who's perfectly solved uh, secrets management. So this is like, you know, your application needs a, a database password. You, know, you need a API keys to talk to some external services. Whatever, like how how do you how do you put that in place? You know, where it's hopefully not in source control. We use HashiCorp Vault. Problem solved. There you go. And then you just, you just the, not. The, software, <laughs> the software has a long lived key that it uses to put a HashiCorp Vault to get the secrets. Problem solved. <laughs> I lock the house and I stick the I stick the key under the mat. Exactly. No, no, I cool. don't stick the key under the house. I stick the Key to the box and the mailbox <laughs> under the mat, and that box has the house key. In it. Okay, I don't want to talk to any people. I use a soft secret <laughs> um, This one gets I've seen this over like a, a ton. Like application dependency uh, security monitoring is maybe not the right word there, but like making sure like both your application code and like nobody writes their own like HTTP getting code. Right, you use a library, you use npm or cpan or whatever to go find somebody's already invented that wheel 
I'm not going to write my own left pad model. <laughs> Green. Green. Yeah, it's like Green that got turned into a back door. <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of tools out there now that'll like, you know, check your you can point it at your application, it can read your, your package.lock or your, you know, whatever the, the version specification thing for your, your language is and like tell you, oh hey, you're pinned to version one dot zero dot one of you know left pad and it's actually has like five holes in it. You should probably update that. There's one for Docker too. Yeah, I remember that our tool I a couple months ago, I needed a spin of like monitoring Docker containers and whatever oh, yeah. packages you may or may not have yeah. inside your Docker container. There's three big ones. There's Claire, which is part of Quay. We looked at there's Claire. Anchor Engine. Anchor Engine. That's and then there's it. DTR. Yeah. And then Twistlock can kind of do that, but it it's good in some ways, but it's really bad about false positives. Uh, alerting we already talked about on the systems longer. Uh, <coughs> yeah, so this is just talking about the stuff I'm earlier. Yeah, scheduled tasks and ad hoc, ta ad hoc tasks. Um, it's like one thing, like especially if you're like you know moving into into cloud native land and you don't necessarily have an instance to log on to anymore. Like, definitely think about how you can expose that sort of functionality without having to be on the box, right? API endpoints or some sort of tooling that can talk to the services without going to the application. Like, you get into a situation where like, oh, you just log on to uh, your API server number three and it has a special script on it and then you just run it. That's that's going to be bad times as you move move away from, from pets into cattle, whether those cattle or uh, EC2 instances or containers or what have you. And that's it. That end snuck up on me. I thought there was one more slide, but or what it would have been. So. Good. Any questions? Ready. Right here. <laughs> Most of them are for the bar afterwards. Can you expand a little bit more on um, configuring things at runtime versus baking into images and how that stacks up with now you've got to manage these images versus the time that you lose during the long way? Yeah. Um, when I was at Chef, I started there. I was on customer team, and uh, this was something that came up a lot, you know, like 2016 or so. Um, yeah, I mean, it kind of depends. Like, sure, if you, to me, it's always like there's a sweet spot in the middle somewhere, depending on the application and the, the underlying stuff you need to configure. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can, you can always just start, like, if it was, I'll just use AWS as an example because that's what I know best. You can start with like a stock AMI straight from Amazon. And you can throw Chef or Puppet or Ansible or some cool bash scripts at it or whatever and just say, like, I can deploy anything on this AMI. Like, I've got my Chef recipe or whatever that will run. Well, that's cool. But every time you spin that up, like, you, now you're, your configuration run to install the app and do all the stuff may take 10, 15, 20 minutes, right? It would be like Apple that's almost bankrupting the company by downloading terabytes and terabytes of pre-learned models out of an S3 bucket. Right, like, I mean, I, 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 a lot of people are like, oh yeah, we'll just have like the AMI download Chef, I was working at Chef, so I was working on we're using Chef, like we'll download the Chef client from Chef, Chef's uh, you know, download server every time we provision a server. So many people I had to go back to our office team and be like, can you unblacklist this IP address? Because they spun up 5,000 nodes and <laughs> got themselves blacklisted to the CDN. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you know, the other end of that, so that, like, that's like you know, way over here on one side. Way over here on the other side is like, yeah, you have golden images. Every time you release your application, you build an AML and that, that version and all the stuff that basically a Docker container in the EC2 is like all the dependencies and the application all, all baked. And now that, that image is very specialized you can't reuse it it's very and you, have, and you have to build one every time you do an application build mm -hmm. um so a lot of times like there's but it's super fast right like you just turn that that ec2 instance on with that ami and like it's it's ready to go so like a lot of times there's a there's a sweet spot of like let's take the really time consuming stuff and maybe put that in the ami so like i worked on i've worked on a couple places that use you know, ruby on rails and uh, if you've ever tried to uh compile the nokogiri gem Oh God! You've, you're used to like hearing your laptop like fan, like sound like your laptop's gonna like actually take its light off your desk, and then like going to get a cup of coffee and sitting around the coffee pot talking for a while and you know catching up on sports scores and still waiting for it to be done. So like that's the kind of thing. Like yeah, your version of Ruby and all your gems doesn't change much. Like maybe go ahead and get some of that stuff baked into your image so you don't have to every time you need to spin up a new node you have to wait on that. But then maybe like you. Deploying a specific version of your application, if that can be done pretty quick, maybe you leave that dynamic so that you can you can still have a base AMI, but you can put whatever version of your app onto it. Okay. So there's there's usually depending on like what exactly you, you need to do and how long it takes of like yeah. do static up to here in an image and then 
maybe do a little bit of dynamic do, do, do a little bit of dynamic on top of that to, to finish it off. Well, that makes me wonder, you know, we see distributions packaging gems as native packaging formats, same for Python. And some languages have that as a first class citizen. Mm -hmm. Interesting to see that potentially used used for Ruby as an option. You say if we detect you're running on rail with factory installed, you know, gems will just give you this binary instead of making you compile it yourself. Well, it'll give you a Docker <laughs> container. Well, you still have to build the Docker container <coughs> somehow. No. <laughs> <laughs> they have to come from somewhere. Just, well, it comes from Docker Hub or wherever, right? Yeah, but for a library? Well, <laughs> then you got to, you know, True, okay. Docker's, Docker containers diverge, never, never to be seen again. Is that it? Anything else? So you're, you're painting a, a picture of <clears throat> uh, this integrated uh, DevOps. So developers are over here, and testers are over here, and the operations people are over here, and the infrastructure is out there in the cloud. And uh, everybody's got their fingers on their little keys. So is that happening because the Business owner, the system owner is naive. Is that happening because the developers don't understand, can't imagine that operations might be different <laughs> from their laptop? Uh, I, don't, I don't know that there is a, I mean, I don't so know that there's a, there is so a reason. bonkers amount of stuff to know that even if you have homogenous organization where you said everyone's an engineer and you put them all in the room, naturally, you're going to have people that slowly find themselves more adept and push into certain roles. In most you know, companies that are small coming up to medium, you'll find that there's going to be a small group of you know, what was just 15 developers. There's about four or five of them that always let the guys wind up dealing with the ops things because they've shown themselves proficient at it. And then you've got maybe one or two guys that actually understand how database indexes work and no one else does. And while they could share that information around it, on there, you could potentially homogenize the group again. Some people aren't gonna take a life of that. And especially in small medium company, you're striving to stay alive. Right, uh, I, I mean, if this isn't interesting to other people here, you know, then I don't wanna take time of it. But um, since the dot-com era, my company's been hired to deploy seven really large scale global applications. And I am repeatedly mystified as to, as to how Fortune 500 companies who hire us when they're doing something green to it, um, apparently are naive about their own systems. You got turnover, you got- you know, They're letting the develop, developers wait till the last minute to talk about Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. If I'm the business owner, they're going to have to be talking from day one. I don't want to see this run on their laptop. You're also. I want to see this run in, in, in a minute. You're also a white box or clear box case. You 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 have you are aware that those departments are not you know like plumbing and accounting who pays the water bill. Right. Whereas you know you have that insight. If someone who comes from a pure business background isn't aware of that, they're very like every blindsided. Especially in many cases, you know, still a lot of companies where ops reports up to the CFO. It, it's also it's misaligned incentives, right? <clears throat> the developers, their incentive is to deploy these features, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's operations' responsibility to keep it running, right? Right. And you know what you see is you know developers will push bugs out, and when it doesn't work, it's operations' fault. Therefore. Operations gets a lot more conservative about what they'll accept, what they install it on, and you know, if the developers don't push the features out, it's their fault. Right? And a lot of this is you know, <clears throat> eliminating those barriers, trying to get everybody aligned on their incentives, coupled with the ability to, to lower the impact of the problems. Right? I can now take an application and deploy to its own data center effectively. Right? Whereas 10 years ago, when you deployed in a physical data center, somebody misconfigures something, you take the whole data center down, right? right. Or, or something bad happens, right? Now I can just kind of say, like, look, 
here's your data center yeah. for your application. Your 10 guys can do whatever they want in there because the only person you're going to hurt yourself, right? So knock yourself out and do what you need to do. You know, I'm not going to be a barrier to you achieving whatever it is you want. Right? Go for so, it. So it's not a, a, a problem of homogenization, uh, me having to understand your skills and his skills and his skills for us to get along. It's a matter of coordinating us. I mean, I never tried to drive my teams to understand each other, but I, I never rewarded them except for a functioning application in the world. That's why you know what I'm saying. If I couldn't log into it from my desktop, I didn't. It didn't exist. That's why I asked about Scrum because this all sounds like variations of the same yeah. thing: yeah. Yeah. organization, and coordination, and teamwork for the, the common good. Yeah. Scrum yeah. is trying to build a system that ensures and limits that you. So basically, when if you're doing Scrum with stakeholders across teams, no work can get scheduled that violates those principles flat out. Now, almost no one ever does that because it requires buy-in across multiple business lines. And unless you've got someone, you can't have someone at the very top because they'll just start axing people, but somewhere, someone kind of in the middle that's pushing that, it doesn't happen. If, you know, my operations department wants to get into Scrum workflow, and things, but we're coming, we have people coming us and saying, we need it tomorrow and our sprints are one week because two weeks was too long to, for, to be able to be responsive. It's like, well, uh, next week is not acceptable. So unless you have buy-in from not only your management, but the groups you're working with, you're going to either just have to allocate half of your time to unplanned work, which is not really following the system, or find a system that does work for you. Yes. But, but the bafflement is that we now have complete virtualization. We have the cloud. And this has all gotten easier. <laughs> in the last it's gotten easier years. to do it right, and it's gotten just as easier to do it wrong. And then, well, that's what I don't understand is that we were doing this well, what? in in 2000, in 1999, and and in a bare metal world. I mean, when you have 116 Windows servers running in a single room in 1999, you you know. NASA comes to visit you. Yeah, I mean, the, the class just makes it easier. Doing. It doesn't make it possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. The example I give is Etsy. I mean, Etsy's a DevOps darling, and they're doing all, the last I checked, they're doing their stuff. Yeah. They, they came back from the cloud because it worked better for them. Yeah. At a certain level, we're, if we're in. You mean the cloud allowed them so many degrees of freedom that they skated off the edge of the pond? Or they didn't give <laughs> a lot of reasons. I think a lot of the reasons were. Etsy's load is fairly flat. They don't spike. They're not like Ticketmaster who would save them a metric butt ton of money by not having to scale to Friday night for the game. Yeah. Turkey, turkey search is a food network you know, for around Thanksgiving. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. tax filing. And, you know, like you know, I worked for a credit card processor. We scaled for Wednesday before Thanksgiving when everyone goes and buy whis buys whiskey. Because that is actually worse than Black Friday. But see, I, about whiskey. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to. Got to deal with this relatives now. It's not. It's not. We're actually running late. We are over time. time. So we may want to adjourn this to the casual. Not the casual point. Wrong. Place. The real meeting. There. The real meeting starts now at uh, K Town Tavern. So just down the road here. But. Thank you, Noah. Yeah, the tools yeah, make you, it thank you, easier. Thank you, Noah. Easier. Thank you, Noah. 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 Thank you, Noah.